Okay, you guys, so today I want to talk about the theology of my childhood. And Elisha and I shared a lot of theological similarities growing up. And I feel like this podcast is for everyone who thinks they don't necessarily, like it's for the Bible-believing Christian that is, I mean, this is who I would say I was, okay? So you might relate to me. You're not a Bible-believing Christian anymore? Still am. But someone who would identify as a Bible-believing Christian, who's Mm non-denominational, who doesn't really use terms to qualify or quantify what's happening in Scripture, Mm -hmm. and would say that um, maybe, like, really appreciate the home church movement, like, not really see a huge benefit in, like, church membership or the hierarchy of the church even, and really just look to the Bible. Like the Bible, scripture can interpret scripture. I don't need outside voices. And um, the Lord can just speak through his word and the Holy Spirit. That is, in a nutshell. That sounds pretty good, honestly. It is. It There's is. nothing wrong with any of that. <laughs> and I'm not, um, this isn't an episode combating that. But what I didn't realize was that that's a theology. There was a systematic theology I was following. And I thought that. I was just like some purist over here with no systematic, like no man's input on my theology, I mm-hmm. guess. And re- Elisha and I recently read a book where I was like, oh my goodness, I have been following a pattern of systematic theology or my childhood was following a pattern of systematic theology that I didn't identify with as systematic theology. It wasn't necessarily taught to me that way. Um, Even the terms I was using were just more, I just thought all Christians use these terms. And I didn't realize that there was a lot of thought and effort and study and um, stuff that went into that theology. So anyways, I just, it was really eye-opening experience for me. And Elisha and I changed some of our, like, I, I don't believe identically to how I grew up. I do think there's pros and cons. And like Elisha just said already, nothing that I mentioned was bad. And yeah, maybe with the exception. I mean, there was a few well, things. Well, we're going to kind of cover it. Yeah. yeah, there are some things that I do think are just straight up unhelpful. But technically, this is an introduction. <laughs> and I'm just kind of diving straight in. So anyways, if you guys enjoy this podcast, give it a thumbs up, share it with a friend, feel free to comment, disagree, agree down below. Uh, we love hearing your thoughts. And if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A box that we will also link down below and share this podcast with a friend if you enjoy it. The Now That We're a Family Podcast. Can I do a disclaimer real quick? Whoa, okay, already. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm the king of disclaimers, and so it's kind of refreshing to hear you want to give a disclaimer, honestly. Well, because when I say the theology of my childhood and how I was raised, I don't want to say that everything that I believed was necessarily like taught to me by my parents right. or by my church. Or it was, this was just kind of, some of it was picked up by osmosis, like Mm -hmm. just the believers we were around, the culture I was in here in America, um, the assumptions that I made from scripture. And so I wasn't necessarily, you know, if I have things that were off or whatever, I'm not saying, oh, my parents taught this to me this way or, or anything like that. I do think some of these aspects were in our home. I really respect my, both my parents and they gave me such a desire to have a relationship with God Mm -hmm. by watching the relationship with God and having the Bible taught in our home. They gave an incredible foundation of scripture and I'm just so grateful. And so, um, some of the, some of the things that I'm, I've kind of like pivoted on or even things that I have interpreted were just my own interpretations yeah you know it wasn't it wasn't necessarily oh my parents error or anything like that it was my own error yes yeah likewise because i I think if if my if i sat down with my parents and was like what were you intentionally instilling into us you know when it came to biblical truths it would be rock solid you know christian teaching just like what it was with your family and just like that's how our parents are and so when we look back to our childhood hopefully those of you that have listened for a while know how eternally grateful we are for our childhoods that were seeped in scripture. The fact that, you know, both of our fathers were 
men of the word, that our mothers were women of the word, where mm-hmm. uh, really not, it's actually convicting even now as I'm saying this, not a day would go by where I wouldn't see my mother or my father in God's word. And yet how, you know, I, I'm thinking of my children. I'm like, do they see me in the word every day? It's like, yeah, most days, you know, like it's, it's really convicting actually now that I, now that I think about it. And so I, I could, we couldn't be, actually I'll speak for myself. I couldn't be more grateful for the biblical foundation I was given, mm-hmm. uh, in my, in my home and the, the energies, the, the energy that my parents put into instilling God's word in, into our hearts. And I think some of the things that I picked up that I was able to identify in this book, like you said, it's not even that it was taught. It's just that it was around. It was the culture that we were in and terms and phrases, uh, were used and concepts were believed and, and practiced that I j- you, you didn't even realize you were doing it, right? You didn't even realize you were believing something. Um, and so it's just fun to identify. And I think even with our parents, it's fun for me to identify when I think of my mother, you know, being brought up in, in Catholic school and then her and her family then going to a Presbyterian church. And then my father really attributing a lot of his salvation um you know, experience to young life, then my parents being young life Christians and then going to a church of God and then going to, you know, being a part of shield of faith and having that be a big part of their life and then going to a Nazarene church. And you're able to kind of retrospectively go back and say, okay, that, that actually makes sense that these terms were, were a part of our home, whether or not it was extremely intentional or not. Yeah. I think a lot of the language that was just around that, that this book clarified for me was Christianese. Like I just thought every single Christian believed this or knew how to talk this way. And I didn't realize that these terms were specific and meant specific things in the fact that like someone thought through this was these terms were popularized at a certain point Hmm. um, for a certain reason. And why I, why I, bring up that point was because you guys, if you know Elisha's in my story, you know that he was reading some reformed books when we were dating the first time. And I had a major issue with that because I really just saw any form of term as being divisive. I thought the study of theology was just something, which is funny now, you know, seeing it just as the study of God, but the study of anything apart from God's word, I should say. So reading man's opinion on scripture was um, just to puff up knowledge, make you feel good about yourself. And it just caused dissension in the brother, brethren. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just really like it didn't matter to your personal walk with Christ. And so why would you go there? You were just a proud person if you were trying to define terms and then argue or debate terms. And um, it was just kind of like ammunition in your back pocket as a Christian. And it was just divisive. So that really, really bothered me. And I didn't realize that I had my own set of terms that had been defined by the culture and by the past 50 decades of Christian, 50 50 decades, 50 years of Christianity here in America, I just didn't realize that they were terms. Mm. I just thought these are just the Christian vernacular that everyone, you know. It's just Christianity. Yeah, it's this Christi- is Christianity. And yes. that is wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Or even if it's not wrong, it's like extra or it's unnecessary, maybe. A- unhelpful to the body. Okay, unhelpful. I definitely saw it as unhelpful. Yeah, and that would be my response, I think, when y- you come across somebody and they say, hey, are you, um, you know, are you a Catholic? No, I'm, I'm a Christian. And they'd be like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm Catholic and I'm a Christian too. It's like, so are you Protestant? I'm like, no, I'm just a Christian. Like, I'm just a Christian Christian and just a Bible believing Christian. And it's like, I would want to be, I was non-denominational. I didn't have a tradition that I was coming from. Uh, the tradition was Christ. And, and I, I think the ideal was really to look back to the early church and be like, this is where my faith comes from. The early church being the epistles, right? Paul's epistles, the gospels, the epistles. I mean, like that is, that is the only tradition that I have is that right there. And then it was my personal salvation, you know, and you've already used one of the lines, right? Like your personal walk with God, like you didn't see it as being helpful to your personal relationship with God or your personal walk. And, and even that right there, that term that was like popularized in a, in a specific time in history and primarily American history. And, and I think it's just, um, it's helpful to, to put some backbone and give some context to even the language that we've been using for years now. And this book's been helpful. I mean, yeah, we like keep talking about the mystery book, but I think it was helpful because 
it, I I still stand by. I see so much of what this book. So it was it was about dispensationalism. And it's called the rise and fall of dispensationalism, and I think it was very helpful because I still don't know where the author stands with any of this stuff. No, like it's I feel like, like a very academic approach just like, to dispensationalism. It feels very objective. And I have to say, we haven't gotten to the fall of dispensationalism. I mean, I think a lot of us feel a change in the air in terms of the conversations that are happening. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more um, variance in discussion, and there's a lot of different theological opinions now being thrown in the Mm -hmm. ring in terms of some things that were just assumed. Um, We're now kind of going back and being like, okay, well, why was this assumed? You know, but we haven't gotten to the the reason why the author says, you know, dispensationalism has fallen out of grace. So just so you guys know, we're like three quarters of the way through the book. We're in the golden age of dispensationalism, which the author says is around the 1930s to the 1960s. And I did read ahead. So. You did. Yeah. Stop. I wasn't sleeping very much last night. And so I did. I did read ahead. Um, so, but all, but I, I, I agree with everything that you said, Katie, babe. And I think it's extremely helpful to the church because when we think about wanting uh, the body to be to grow in Christ, to grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to grow in our knowledge of God, you know, that theology grown in knowledge of, of him. Uh, we want to be refined. We want to be sharpened. We want to become more effective in society. We want to be more effective in encouraging and equipping each other. Uh, and I think having beliefs or terms or f- phrases or just like just even doctrines challenged things where you have to go back and rethink it is helpful i used to see that as being unhelpful and being like well let's just keep the simple i would use terms like just the simplicity of god's word or just the simple gospel like like why are we complicating this it's very it's very simple and i and i still do think that the gospel is very simple and that's you know so much of the profundity does come um from how simple it is uh to the, the gospel uh however because of society, because of life, because of the world, when you are challenged and when you are at times even forced to solidify your belief, I think it's helpful to the church. It's helpful to your own faith and to your family. And so I like that there's this, you know, amongst millennials and amongst our peers, there's this kind of resurgence of re- uh, re-clarifying almost, you know, re-solidifying what the fundamental beliefs are of Christianity. And in doing that, you start to go down this path, this path of like, well, what if, you know, what if past Christians believed? And then all of a sudden you're into church history and then you're into the councils and you're thinking about the creeds and you're thinking about different ways, different lenses in which you've viewed God's word and the scripture. And I think it's all very helpful. We love live music in our home. I think you would love live music in your home if you don't already enjoy it in your home. And that's why we made Voperg Music Academy. Check out the coupon below and you get a special discount for being a listener of this podcast. And you can bring live music into your home. Piano, guitar, fiddle, mandolin, ukulele. If any of those instruments sound like fun to you to learn or to have your children learn, go check it out. Yeah, we are reading The Coddling of the American Mind, which is a phenomenal book. And the author the authors just bring to light the importance of a healthy environment has discussion and debate and that's a growth environment that is where you're being challenged that's where critical thinking is happening that's where you're forced to go to god's word and mean like okay so so and so didn't agree with me on this i just thought this was assumed what does scripture say about this what do i believe about this and that is so healthy and we want to raise our children in an environment where these discussions and even healthy debates that are all done in humility and in love and in unity are are a healthy part of conversation. I love that we have friends and we have family that we can discuss these things with and disagree on. And then I'm always going back to the Bible afterwards and being like, I just thought everyone believed this way. Or or what does this verse really mean in context? Because so-and-so pulled it out and I hadn't heard it in that context before. And I just... um, It's just a healthy way for our brains to think. And I think as Christians, that's one really cool thing that you're able to see when you see church history is like you see dispensationalism hit America around the 1920s. And it is so cool to see how the Lord has used it to rapidly spread global missions, to 
bring unity after the North and the South and the Civil War. Yeah, because I think it hit before 1920. It really like was ignited in the 1920s. Okay, okay. But it came in the 1800s as yes, far as that's right. Darby bringing it over and then D.L. Moody. Hold on, hold on. Maybe I want to go into like specific history. Okay. Do you want to do that? No. Let's, well, you finish what you were saying. Sorry. I was getting <laughs> caught up in the... Well, we're kind of like jumping all around because maybe <clears throat> you're like, okay, what even is dispensationalism? So do you want to say like... I don't even know if I can explain it very well. So because I grew up not knowing that I was dispensational in all my thinking. And then I read this book. And I'm like, oh, this is everything... This, this is the lens through which I read the Bible and still read much of the Bible. And I knew that that was uh, counteracted just as of as of late. I've, you know, over the last few years, realized that another popular uh, system or framework to read the, the Bible through, to read the scriptures through, is covenant theology. And that these two are, are just different. There's They're both Christian. They're both, you know, like, the, the, both of them hold to much of Orthodox Christianity. Um and I saw them as two, and I was like, okay, these are two different things. And God's the covenant theology, which is, I think, the majority of people we've been listening to and reading over the last two or three years. And so so that's shaped how we've read the Bible, um, really believes that there is, God works through covenants, and that he's got his people that, you know, were the children of Israel, um, that is the church. And there's not a huge, like, um, there's, there's not this, like, different set of, of, of um, principles or even mission for his people. Whereas I think the dispen- dispensationalists, and again, this is hard for me to, I don't think I can wrap my mind around it still um, fully because uh, it's still, I think, so seeped in how I think. But God has worked through different dispensations. Um, you know, the, I think seven is what po- is popularized. The creation, you know, when there was no sin and, that, and he had a certain set of, um, I guess, leading principles guiding principles i'm i'm doing terrible at this no you so, are You're doing is this great. all right yeah i should probably just pull it up like on wikipedia no no and it's then like there is it. um then there there was the fall and you know uh there was just before i i'm gonna pull this up or okay so there's some leading tenets maybe of dispensationalism instead of I mean, I don't know all seven dispensations, but some things that are really specific to it are a church and Israel separation. So we see the church is being distinctly different from the nation of Israel. So in dispensationalism, instead of covenant theology, which covenant theology sees Israel, then the coming of Christ, then the church taking over that role of Israel, and it is a one chosen people. So there's neither, like now, today, there's neither Jew nor Greek, circumcision or uncircumcision. The co- covenant theology views that to mean that there is no nationality preference when it comes to God's chosen people, and it's just those that are circumcised in him, the circumcision of the heart, or not. And that is a a more direct, there's variations of that, but that's kind of how covenant theology identifies the one chosen, one chosen people that God's speaking to in scripture. It's always applicable to you as a Christian because we are now Abraham's seed and we are benefits of Abraham's promise. Whereas dispensationalism kind of has a view of more two chosen peoples. There is Israel, right? In the Old Testament. And then once Christ comes, the nation of Israel still has a special calling and is still chosen in a specific way as relates to biblical prophecy. So um, a lot of dispensationalists will interpret the nation of Israel as still having meaning here in terms of you know, biblical prophecy and identifying the timeline of when, of the Lord's second coming and things like that. And then the church is outside of that and it's it's following parallel, but our, our home here is in heaven. And so on top of separating really a church and Israel distinction, there's also a very strong separation and dispensationalism between the kingdom of earth and the kingdom of heaven. So the nation of Israel has a very specific calling to the earth here today. It's a very physical, um, physical situation, right? They have to rebuild the temple for the Antichrist to come and all these all these things to happen. Um, whereas the kingdom of the church is for the kingdom of heaven. So a lot of hymns were popularized during the kind of the golden age of dispensationalism, which we sing today, you know, all fly away, oh glory, all fly away. Mm-hmm. Um, or this world's not my home, I'm just passing through. And it's really a focus on the church's purpose 
is for heaven. So we're supposed to save souls here, here on earth, but eventually we, we reign with God in heaven and everything here in this world, we just shouldn't get caught up in. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause it's just, it's just not our home. So that's a dispensational principle. And so basically it just really separates out those things Al- alongside of that premillennialism is a big tenant of dispensationalism because that is the last dispensation, Christ's second coming. So I don't know if you want to explain the dispensations now, but that's kind of what stuck out to me are that like the core tenets of dispensationalism is that separation. Yeah. And I think that that was a huge factor in how I would then read the Old Testament growing up. And I think how many people do trying to understand how this relates to me as a, as a Christian, as that, you know, that other chosen people, that is now just reserved, you know, I, I'm, what is it? First Peter, you know, you are holy nation or no, um, wherefore you are, you know, you have a, um, godly inheritance reserved in heaven for you. Like that was my inheritance. It was reserved in heaven for me and everything else that the Bible would talk about when it came to earthly ramifications was just like, I don't like, I don't know how it relates to me. I don't know what, why it pertains to me at all, unless it's maybe helpful in, in saving the soul. What were you, did you find it? Well, I didn't. I thought of a verse that was kind of similar in Galatians, Galatians 3. And it says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Mm. And if ye be in Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Mm. And so when I would find verses like this in the New Testament or the Old Testament, I would kind of have to put on my thinking cap and be like, okay, does this apply to me? Does this not apply to me? Um, I'm clearly not of Jewish descent, I'm grafted in to, you know, Israel, but I'm not literally Abraham's seed. Right. It's figurative, right? Yeah. So these verses kind of, as they, especially if I'm reading them in the Old Testament, I would say, okay, well, those clearly applied to the nation of Israel. If I'm reading them in the New Testament, then there's a good chance they're applying to me, mm-hmm. unless Paul's speaking specifically to the Jews. But you kind of have to sort out which chosen person... Yeah. Is he speaking to the nation here of Israel or is he speaking to the church? And that's kind of something that I always um, was was confused about with certain passages in Scripture. Growing yeah, up. exactly. Because there are some promises to his to God's people that talk about earthly reign. They talk about earthly rule. And But then the one I was referencing is First Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the bed from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith and salvation ready to be revealed in this last time because that, that was one that we memorized growing up you know it says wherein we greatly rejoice though now for a season if need be you are in heaviness through manful temptation and I was like man that that like encapsulated much of how I viewed this life right there is this is all just a trial this this whole earth leave existence is a trial and our only reward is going to be in heaven and we are will weary pilgrims you know and that's why you sing all fly away because there is no really like joy or victory to be had for the for the church here on earth it's all reserved in heaven for um for for us who are kept by the power of god through faith unto salvation and and that was the context in which i would read the whole the the scriptures, right? And I would own, and I would have that be the lens uh, that I read everything. And so, anyways, yeah, it's been very fascinating to read this book and to see how much of that lens was really given to me. I did inherit a lens, and you said in the introduction, I think there's this ideal of, you know, getting saved. And then like with no outside input or influence and just the Holy Spirit re- sitting down and opening the Bible and letting the unadulterated word of God have its, you know, effect on you. And that sounds really great, but that's impossible. Like regardless of when you were saved, uh, you're going to come to God's word with, you know, a set of beliefs, right? And, and a lot of it's going to be you know, then that was the early church. That's like the early church. There was people that were coming from a Jewish background. And then there was these Gentiles coming in with a bunch of pagan practices and and traditions. And the, the early books are really combating a lot of these, uh, thoughts that they're bringing in that, that they're now receiving Christianity through the context of. And, and that 
continues on to this day. And so it's impossible, you know, when you think of, man, if, if, if I could just be on an island, I would say this all the time, if I could just like be on an island with a Bible, no outside input or influence, then I'd really be able to get what God wanted me to get from his word. But that's not, that's never been the case. Man has never had this like uh, pure filter through which they could see God's word. And so you need to be aware of your filter. You need to be aware of your history, your traditions, uh, be able to go back and then use God's word as the filter and say, okay, the, you know, the the church fathers, they, they were so right on in this point. I don't think that this was aligned with God's word. You know, our parents were so right on with this. They, they might have like misinterpreted this passage, but to think that we could just go to God's word and have it without any outside influence or opinion influence is, it's not possible. Yeah. And that was something that was interesting to me because I always had that belief that it was and something that, so basically if you go back to like the 1800s where this book starts, this guy named Darby was trying to start an Irish revival. I think it was in Ireland and the Catholic church was shutting him down. He was trying to bring convert Catholics to Protestants. And so the church was shutting him down and then the state was shutting him down and he got really fed up with the whole thing. He's like, we're on the cusp of revival here. I'm working my face off and nothing is happening. And it's because the church and the state are both just out to get me. He ended up breaking his back on his horse as like a circuit riding preacher and was laying in bed and just started riding like crazy on this dispensationalism was not coined at the time, but he really started popularizing, hey, Christians are not even of this earth. We aren't going to have success here on this earth. There's no point in trying to establish the church and the state working in unity together. We're just bound for heaven. And so let's save souls here on earth. And he really started just encouraging the church to look for Christ's coming as a exit plan from the world. We just need to get people saved and then we got to get out of here because there's nothing here in this in this world for us. And so he brought that over to America in the 1800s. And it's interesting because it really started growing in popularity after the Civil War mm. because up until that point... America was primarily founded by a post-millennial perspective where it was, okay, we are going to establish this government to last forever or until Christ's victorious return. We and the church and the state are going to walk in lockstep to bring the gospel to the nations. Mm. And America is going to be a big part of that. And that was our founding father's perspective theologically when they came to America and set up our government. And so... At the point of the Civil War, everyone became really disenfranchised with this unity. Yes. And dispensationalism, which again was not this term at the time, but this this concept of a separation between church and state, this concept of a separation between two earthly kingdoms, was like, hey, forget the politics. The church was trying to unite and unify after, especially border states, after the war with all of these, you know, with the Jim what do you call it? Jim Crow, Jim Crow. Yeah. those laws and all that stuff. And so pastors really found this helpful to unite their congregations of like, Hey, we're over all this politics yes. stuff. We can disagree on that level, but like as Christians, this world is not our home. We're bound for heaven. And so let's just focus on eternal things. There's no point in trying to unite over politics anymore. There's no point in trying to select uh, or elect a government that is going to be moral or enforce morality right. or all these things um that's like just said, unhealthy and up until this point and, and when you look at history you can see why that makes a ton of sense like yeah. christians were so discouraged with the civil war there's brothers fighting against brothers that are both you know pro- professing christians and you're thinking what are we doing here like we're killing each other over these policies or just different different laws that we want to instate let's keep it about just christ and it was probably really refreshing we could we could see that i mean in 2020 right all the division here in the country we're like hey none of this matters like let's just keep it about the gospel just keep it about christ but up until that point it really was unheard of to not have a vested interest in what we would now call earthly things, mm-hmm. right? In politics, we, it, regardless of whether or not these people were proactively post-millennial, they just, it, they saw the church's duty of being like, hey, we want to have, 
laws that are honoring to God. We want to have people in positions of power and authority that are submitted to God's word. And as a result of that, they were they were involved. And so it really was a turning point for our country. And like you said, you can see you can, I, I, you can see why. Like talk about a dramatic thing to happen to your mm-hmm. country where there's this civil war and churches are trying to find something to unify over and they by and in order to do that, they kind of like had to subtract as much as they could. There's kind of like, a, we can't talk politics. Let's get out of business. Let's get out of, you know, literature. Let's just keep it about the gospel. Let's just keep it about heaven. You know, Katie, with the Get It All Done Club, even though you sell that to women and it's for women, I feel like the husbands and men are the biggest beneficiaries of that program. And and I cannot tell you, when you implement these systems and when you started being conscientious of how you were running our household and how you were managing yourself and you were maximizing your time, I was like, wow, who is this woman? You were so enjoyable. You were always enjoyable to be around. But it's like you went, there was truly a 2.0 moment, I feel like, in our life. And I don't know if husbands realize how much it benefits them when their wives partake in the Get It All Done Club. Well, I'm glad that you say that. Something that I think is cool is that whatever matters to you and your husband, whatever matters to your vision, whether that's going on more vacations or starting a side hustle together or spending time investing in the children's extracurriculars, whatever that is, you will have the time and energy to start investing in that instead of spending so much time doing the monotonous, redundant tasks. And so that's something that I love about the Get It All Done Club. I actually never discount the program. If you're curious for a little taste of it, I have a free masterclass down below and we would love to have you join our community of thousands of Christian women who are encouraging each other and working towards creating more peacefully productive homes. And evangelism really shifted at this point, too, because up until this time, we really saw the majority of Christians really saw um, electing governments and institutions for Christianity to as a, the way to bring the gospel to the nations. And you see this done kind of in an unhelpful way, not kind of in an unhelpful way with like the holy wars or something like that. But there have been different times in history. That was a big reason why Americans were, or Englishmen were leaving America, leaving Britain. Yeah. <laughs> wow, good. my geography is right here. And coming to America was to elect a government. Like the, one of the first things they did once they started surviving here was create a government. Hmm. It wasn't just like, hey, there's all these... Um, like you know what they call like these savage people here we're going to just evangelize them it's like no we're going to get some infrastructure get infrastructure infrastructure in and that was the perspective and once dispensationalism started hitting it really started promoting um, global evangelism global evangelism started spreading like crazy with missionaries going out and being like, we don't need to elect governments in these places. We just need to share the gospel because Christ is coming. His return is imminent. The rapture really started getting popularized at this point, the silent rapture, and that went along with dispensationalism. Um, Obviously, the imminent return of Christ happening any day. And so I think it's, it's very interesting to see how God has used different things to spread his word at different times in history. Obviously, the, the founding of America was, I think, a really integral part of history in terms of, uh, in part of, in, the, in Christian history mm-hmm. of spreading the gospel, you know, creating a Christian nation. I mean, we're a huge population of the globe. Yeah. In terms of like just size, yeah. matter. Not like, to mention influence beyond our population. Yeah. Like, and the, so it's like that was huge. And then this big, fresh burst of like, hey, let's just go evangelize the nations with missionaries really was huge for other countries. Yeah. And, and like you said, they made, there was a huge shift. And in, in, again, Darby um, connected with D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was in Chicago at the time. And again, one of my childhood heroes, read, I read a handful of biographies on, on Dwight Moody. And just that guy that was like, he was, you know, the what, what what do you call that? Like the every man's man or whatever, what do you call it? Yeah, something like you know, really, like, like very relatable, right? Yeah. Like you're just a shoe salesman. He said, hey, you don't need, you know, a pedigree in, in theology or you don't need to know, you know, Latin or you don't need to know Greek in order to truly get the profundity of God's word. And and he was a charismatic man, obviously, that God used in, in a dramatic way. Um, but he really 
grabbed hold of dispensationalism and premillennialism. Not so much. It's funny because the book, even when you hear his quotes, it's, it's not even that he believed it. He just saw it as being helpful in evangelism. He's like, oh man, if people think that Christ's returning like tomorrow, they're far more likely to repent of their sins and to profess Christ as their savior. Uh, so he used it more of like a, an evangelism tactic. Uh, but I think that something that was really interesting, how there was to see this shift from, like you said, America, when we, when we came, when, when, when the when people from, from Britain came and established a government, it's not that that was the end goal. They wanted evangelism to ha- happen. They wanted God's word to spread, but they saw the necessity of a God-honoring system that could support a society. And we shifted away from doing that. And, and like you said, we always point out the negativity of the, cru- of the Holy Wars Crusade, you know, or the Spanish Inquisition. And we're like, see, it doesn't work. You can't, you know, you can't legislate morality or you can't enforce godly principles on a people. And so we really went the other direction. We're like, well, we're not going to get involved at all with people's governments. We're just going to send missionaries to save souls, to save individual souls and to try to save as many people as we can. And I think a lot of those efforts were fruitful. You know, I think a lot of souls were saved and, and I think the church did grow through that, but I think that there was some reaction. It was over. It was an overreaction, I think, because of what again going back to the Civil War, um, where I think the church could have actually been benefit. It could have benefited from having a more holistic perspective on building a Christian society, evangelism, giving them some giving infrastructure when we would go to different places in India and Africa and, you know, in Asia. And instead of just saving souls and then leaving them to their godless society, actually having a, a motivation to change their society as well. Yeah. And, and kind of the downside of this whole thing is obviously it's beautiful that in Christ we are above all of, you know, the muddle here on earth. But it is a beautiful thing to live in a Christian society and in a in a moralistic society and a government that supports that. It's so freeing to raise our children that way. I mean, you ask people that are trying that are converting and trying to raise their families in places like the Middle East or in China, and it's brutal. Mm. And so I think kind of the downside is Christians getting out of politics. The majority of Christians kind of looking like, okay, that's just a waste of time. Um, money is not worthwhile to have. It's only something that gets ca- you get caught up in. It's only a temptation. Um, so now secular people are leading with the money and what they are funding, abortion and, you know, LGBTQ plus, you know, all agendas, this st- yeah. agendas, all these agendas that are getting pushed forward because they're far fewer Christians that see it as being relevant to earn money and and promote things. And the same thing with politics. We kind of go, hey, it's a waste of time. The world's going to burn anyway. God's coming home tomorrow. And it can lead to passive Christians, unfortunately. Um, so I think that has been the downside of embracing this. Yeah. But there have been good, good parts of it as well. Yeah, things that I really appreciated about when I was reading early, early on Darby's writings um, just that concept that you don't need a priest, you don't need a, a clergyman to explain the word of God to you on a daily basis. Like mm-hmm. you, when you have access to God's, but when you have access to God's to a Bible, you have access to God's word, right? You, the the layman can receive food from God's word by sitting down and reading it. And that was something that really was a novel concept at the time, obviously still fresh off, well, not fresh, but closer to the Reformation where the Catholic Church had such a strong influence on all of Christianity. And even early Protestantism really put a high high place on the clergy. And I think evangelicals and, you know, our modern church could put a higher place on it now. That's another shift of dispensationalism is like not valuing at all the, the church offices. Um, but I do think that that was, that was a positive thing. I, I liked that mm-hmm. he emphasized like, hey, sit down and read your Bible. You know, that, that term that, um, what was it like? Every, every man's a, pr- we're our, our own priest or something. I forget, I forget what it was, but it's like, we, God, Jesus Christ is our mediator. We have access to God, the father through him, sit down with the word of God. You know, the Holy spirit will, will, I guess, guide you. It's, it's very plain, even, you know, just reading God's word. So that was an emphasis I think was very helpful of the time. And I think it's why people like my dad 
sat down and read the Bible a mm-hmm. ton was because they were encouraged by people that came from that uh, f- you know, train of thought that came from that school of thought that was like, Hey, you don't need to have, you know, a master's degree or a PhD in, in biblical studies. You can sit down and, and know what this means. It's like very self-explanatory. And I think that more people need to have that perspective and just read their Bible a ton. Yes. And that's been something that's been really cool. I agree with that. And, and something that was really interesting to me as I was reading this was like, Oh, this is why All the believers I was raised around were very anti-church membership, Mm -hmm. church hierarchy, denominationalism. This was all from that um, wind of of dispensationalism coming in and through America was I think it started with a really awesome thing, which is every one of us can open up scripture and learn from it. But it also skewed toward, you know, people we're humans, right? And we like to take things to a place where they're, they weren't intended to go and toward anti-intellectualism yes. and a dislike of someone else's input on the scripture, a dislike of spiritual authority being anyone aside from the Bible and God, yeah. not seeing any reason for the church hierarchy um, in terms of leadership or spiritual authority that way. Um, and so I think it can lead to, and and this is what the book points out, even these plain readings of scripture that were really popularized um, by Darby was this Bible reading method, which was, hey, just read plain scripture, right? It started kind of turning weird. It was open to actually, it sounds really good, but it's actually open to even more interpretation because you don't have church history backing it. And so we end up with things like numerology, And it's funny because I thought, wow, numerology is so cool. Don't you see how scripture aligns and connects and all these things? But when he goes into even the man that wrote the first popularization of numerology, he goes, well, it becomes kind of confusing when division and multiplication and addition and subtraction are involved. And it was kind of interesting how even this numerology is very open to very open to interpretation, I guess, because any number can be divided and added and subtracted to end up with the explanation that you want, you know, or we ended up with pyramidology um, and all these different forms of interpreting scripture that, again, if you were like a one guy on an island coming up with a theory, this might happen. Yeah. And it can be kind of unhelpful. And I think we see that with um, the cult that my grandpa and um, family, my dad and his brothers, they grew up in was it was a lot of man's interpretation getting added to scripture, even though it was supposed to be a plain reading. And eventually um, my grandpa got excommunicated from marked from that group and kicked out because he, he was like, hey, guys, this is not right. We can't be doing this type of stuff. But they didn't really have the church structure or the church disciplinary structure to like be kept accountable mm-hmm. to God's word, the leadership in that, in that group. And so while it started out with really good intentions, man's just infusion into the scripture just started meaning whatever they wanted it to mean. Mm-hmm. And there was no accountability. So there's kind of like there's pros and cons to this um no doubt because when you say just have a plain reading of scripture that sounds so nice yeah but then what is that like what a plain reading of scripture is going to be so different with each person and and we know that from other literature right we can all read a poem when we know much of the you know parts of the bible is poetry we can all read a poem and have a completely different takeaway from it and so you try to get a collect so what do you do you get you find the author's intent like, what's the author's intent in this poem? And they ultimately are the authority on it. But I do think that systems can help you get to the author's intent when it comes to God's word. We don't want our own private interpretation of God's word. We want to discover the author's intent. And something that I always used to say, because I heard, you know, one of my favorite pastors say it growing up, and I don't think I believe it so much anymore. He says, when you read the Bible, the last thing you should ask is, what does it mean? You should just ask, what does it say? And I was thinking, well, that sound, that makes sense. Because if you ask what it means, you're infusing your own thoughts into it. And if you just read what it says, then it's the word that's having the effect on you. But that's a very impossible thing to do. And obviously, we know that with the author's intent, 
what he's saying actually isn't literally what he's saying, right? There's metaphors in the Bible. I already said there's poetry, there's allegories, there's parables. And so if you take that logic and you say, well, what does it say and apply it to everything in the Bible, then you will be, I think, led astray at some point. So asking what does it mean is a is an important question when you're reading when you're reading the Bible. But then having some structure t- to then discover what it does mean, having uh, so a system to work with, having some church history, having other thoughts and voices to be able to uh, r- uh, rely on, or not rely on, but to, to look to for, for help. And, and I'm going to say one more thing, something that was really, I guess, discouraging, not discouraging, I don't know, humbling, was how, how unoriginal I felt when I was reading this book and how it's been such a common thing for, well, at least, you know, for the last few hundred years. For, for basically young Christian zealots to be like, hey, like, let's actually start our own church that's j- truly un- uninfluenced by government or by all these church traditions, non-denominational, you know, and where we just get to hear God's word. And it's just like the early church where, you know, we're all in one accord together because that was me and you know like pretty much all my groups of friends and actually some of those groups of friends did start churches right they that with no with no church uh history behind it it wasn't a church plant with no formal pastoral training because you know where does the bible talk about there need being a need for pastoral training anybody can start a church anybody can be a pastor and and that was much of my young adult life and just i held to that like anybody that went to seminary it's just they were going there like you said to puff themselves up to learn old dead terms that just make them feel more important than they really are rather than seeing God's word and discerning between what's right and what's wrong in God's word as being a skill that can be acquired through study and through leaning on other experts. Anyways. Yeah. And seeing the church as a gift that God has given us. Yes. Because even like Elisha pointed out, when God gave, when, when the early church was happening, God gave the church, the disciples, the apostles to be able to teach his word Mm -hmm. and, and, and to establish the doctrine. Establish those things, yeah. And so the church is a healthy, helpful thing that God has given us. And it doesn't, it, yes, it's imperfect. It's not infallible like no, the Word yeah, of the God word is. No, the Word the authority. But yes. it can help us in interpreting the Word of God. And so when we just sit in isolation outside of the church, and um, I grew up in a lot of home churches and stuff like that, and and often those were formed by people who just really saw the church as being nothing but unhelpful, and meaning the church is obviously we're all like as believers a part of the church, but the the physical church buildings and just really wanted to get away from all of that, where I think that that's a helpful guide that the Lord has given us. Oh, I mean, it's it's exactly it's how we are to live and have our being. It's in the context of the church. And, and even though uh, individual salvation and regeneration needs to take place for, uh, for that person to, to be saved, it's like the epistles are all written to the church, right? They're written to churches. They're not written to individuals. Of course, here we always take them and apply them only to ourselves. And we say, what does this passage mean to me? Or how am I going to apply this to my life? What's the personal application? Uh, and, and you know, what's interesting is this book also highlighted this turning point where they stopped, they kind of like that whole nominal Christian or sincere Christian or truly regenerate. Actually, they didn't use the term regenerate. They said, you know, a truly born again Christian. Terms like that really started becoming popular. Um, and, and I think it was, I think this is one of those things that in the big picture was harmful, even though on the surface, I think it was, it seemed helpful in the sense that they didn't assume everybody in the congregation was saved. So they said, we need to evangelize to the church. And so they said, I don't think people are really saved here in the church. And so we need to bring the gospel to the church. And on, on, on the face, I think that's good because we, we always need to hear the gospel. I hope every church in America hears the gospel on a regular basis. And that's why I do love there being, you know, in some liturgical churches, the creeds being read on a regular basis every Sunday, you know, the gospel being clearly laid out as part of the service. I think that's crucial because Christians need to hear the gospel on a regular basis. Uh, However, I think what that did a disservice to was actual church discipline and the function of the church. Because when you, what, what I grew up saying was if somebody was living in sin, then they weren't really a Christian. 
if somebody didn't wasn't taking their faith seriously, you know, that's like in air quotes, or they weren't really walking with the Lord, or they weren't um, sincere in their faith, they weren't really a Christian. And if you were sincere in your faith, then you were going to do X, Y, and Z, you know, walk in purity and, and pursue the Lord, read his Bible every day. And everybody that was going to church that wasn't doing those things were just nominal Christians. But I think that the reason that's a disservice in qualifying people like that is because when you look at the epistles, G, or Paul is writing to the church. And he's then rebuking people that are living in sin as brothers, as sisters, as fellow members of Christ's church. And that's the context in which he can rebuke them. And that's the context in which we can go to a fellow brother and say, hey, like, you know, you seem to be drinking too much. Or, hey, you know, are you? how are things going with you and your wife? You seem to not be treating her well. How are things going there? Or if there is fornication, if there is sexual sin, what is the mechanism for then disciplining that person and bring, calling them to a higher level. When all you view those people as is just non-Christians, you don't really do anything about it. Because the Bible also has the instructions for what to do if those people continue to live in those, sin, those sins that you call them out on and call themselves brothers. It's like, well, disassociate with those people. But that's a completely different thing than saying like what became really popular to do and I grew up doing this, like, well, they're not really Christians, or they're not sincere in their faith, or they're not born again. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't think they're taking their faith. They're not walking with the Lord at this time. And so you just hope that they get saved, when in reality, when you look at the New Testament, saved people were falling into sin, and then it was the church's job to call them out of that sin and to build up the church. And so I think that that was one of those, in reading that the whole kind of like, history of that and realizing how that's exactly how I, I don't, I'm, again, I don't think my parents taught me to think this way at all. I just think it was the world, the culture we lived in where you didn't, if you saw somebody that was showing up at church, or e- even if you went pe- drove past a church on Sunday and the parking lot was totally full, you'd be like, well, 90% of those people are not Christians. Like that was just the assumption, right? Like you're like, they, they're not really Christians. There's probably some sincere believers in that building that, that truly love the Lord you know, that really want to want to honor him. Everyone else is just a nominal Christian or they're a cultural Christian. And I think that, again, it's doing a disservice to the actual church because when you view, because what do you have? If you have to take people at face value at some point. Say, hey, I'm a Christian. Oh, right on. I'm a Christian too. Hey, yeah. Well, yeah, I live with my girlfriend. Okay. You said you're a Christian. Why are you living with your girlfriend? Versus, which I've done countless times, I'm a Christian too. Oh, I'm a Christian. I live with my girlfriend and I think to myself, well, they're not really a Christian and I walk away, right? Like that's the... It leads to really judgy Christianity Yeah, is what it leads to. And like you said, it's really unhelpful to the church. And this is again why I'm reading this book just going like, oh my word, this makes so much sense in the light of American church history, why we have this vocabulary, because all the revivals were happening during this time. So people were getting saved, making this profession of faith in a moment. And this was actually what was really popularized during the revivals was um, praying the sinner's prayer, Mm -hmm. right? That was really popularized during this. And so all this evangelism was happening like fire and Darby's followers called the Brethren, which I just, I just think it's ironic they were called the brethren because like they didn't want to associate with you know anyone else, so they're just like this this little small let group. But they were going in, and the author makes this comment that this was the first time in history. Well, he's quoting someone else who was saying it at the time, but this was the first time in history where such a um, there has always been an, a known understanding that the evangelist and the discipler or the teacher had very different roles. Hmm. So the evangelist saved people, the teacher came in and discipled. And that was always an assumption in Christianity, but this was the first time. Well, God saved people. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, but the evangelist would break, preach the gospel. Yes. Yeah, exactly. There were different gifts yeah. in terms of, of teaching. The evangelist who's spreading Christianity like wildfire does not have the opportunity to give each individual believer the discipleship that they need to really ground their faith. And so this was the first time in history, though, that the church and the brethren went in and started feeling the need to evangelize the church Hmm. instead of just viewing like, yeah, these are baby believers. Like we read in, in, we've been reading a ton of the New Testament in light of this book. And, you know, Paul is calling out these people for incest, the church, adultery, 
lascivishness, drunkenness, drunkenness, all these things were in the church. And he's not saying, hey, you guys need to get saved. He's saying, hey, stop doing this. You're Christians. Yeah, repent. Repent, like, repent, from repent from your sin. And I was like, this is like my whole life. I grew up using the term nominal Christian or they're a professing believer, meaning they profess faith in Christ, but they aren't living it or they aren't walking as Christians. And we had all these divining terms for who was like a real Christian and who wasn't a real mm. Christian in terms of what their walk looked like. And Elisha and I have talked about this just in months past being like, why do we have to clarify? But then like some people clearly don't seem like they're walking out their faith. So what do we call them? Right. And it's like now reading scripture and, and in light of church history with this book, it's kind of like, oh, well, you take them at face value and you call them out. Right. And then they can choose to be like, no, I want to walk in sin. And then you go, okay, well, then I'm going to treat you as an unbeliever. Yeah. Right? You aren't you aren't walking according to, you're walking in direct rebellion to God, and therefore you aren't one of yeah, his. Yeah, or again, that other passage, I'm going to disassociate with you. Yeah. You know, because you're, cause you're bringing sin into the church, especially if they are trying to have fellowship with the church. And that's, once again, going back to the one of the helpful functions of the church and what I, and I, and I also church membership is that that's where that church discipline is exercised, right? There's an actual, I guess, um, like mechanism for church discipline versus the, the free roaming Christian that, that is so common in America where they say, I'm a Christian, you know, to, yeah, that's great. Let's read the Bibles and they're living in sin. And somebody's like, well, Hey, you can't do that. And they're like, okay, I'm going to keep doing it. And there's nothing to then, um, expel them from right there's nothing to there's no mechanism for discipline in in that scenario and it's funny because i i used to think it being a it, it would be a bad thing when people would say are you a christian i'd say yeah and they go well where do you go to church like that's the follow-up question and i'm more and more of an advocate of that follow-up qu- question it's like i'm a oh, i'm a christian too where do you go to church i go to church here or where are you a member what church are you a member of that really should be the next logical question because the Bible makes it clear that it's expected the Christians are in fellowship in a local community, in a local way, in a very practical way, you know, in a consistent way. And and so I, I used to, I guess, you know, not like that. I'd be like, well, what are you talking about? I'm a part of the global church if I'm a Christian. Like we're all a part of the church and we can meet at the coffee shop or we can meet at the park or we can whatever, you know, we can go to the pub and, and we're all the church wherever we go. And and, and it's funny that that mindset really was, once again, popularized in, in that time frame. Yeah. And like you said, it's just been unhelpful for us being discipled as exactly. Christians. Maturity. There's a lack of accountability and there's a lack of maturity in our Christian faith. But that's not to say that America and, and other countries aren't, isn't still full of Christians. Right. Exactly. It's just because I think with this, with this theology of the church is just going to shrink down to this tiny little elect group group anyways like the world's just getting worse and worse christianity's receding and receding it enforces that theology right. of well i kind of like it if there's all these you know mega churches per se or you know other denominations or the catholic church or whatever whatever denomination of christianity you want to villainize i'm going to say they aren't they aren't christians my sect of christianity we're the true believers over here we have the pure unadulterated word of god and we're like maybe 75 families. Yeah, so the exactly. Lord must be coming soon, <laughs> you know, and, and it's all a reinforcing circle yeah. because the theology enforces itself. And so instead of trying to disciple the church, we see it as a sign of the Lord's coming that there are a bunch of, you know, nominal Christians, yes. I'm going to put in air quotes, walking around. So it was exactly. a very eye-opening concept to me when I read it, I was like, this is why I believe that. And this isn't something that the church has always acted like. Mm-hmm. This is a fairly recent um, speculation on the church in terms of the revivals. And even the concept of like, like when he pointed this out, it was like, we use this all the time growing up, like, oh, they're a worldly Christian mm. or they're worldly. They're acting worldly. And I remember I was dating Elisha and he was like, what do you even mean by saying they're worldly? Like, would someone say you're worldly? Like, they're worldly if they, you know, wore X outfit or they're worldly if they, whatever. Yeah, drank alcohol drank or alcohol watched these movies. or had or... a tattoo or, you know, there was just like a list of arbitrary random things I had where it was like, you're worldly if. And he's like, I feel like you need to be more specific in those terms. And he really challenged me on that. And I thought so, 
I mean, I felt so like oh my goodness, when I look and started seeing that um, identifying that Christians were worldly was a brethren concept. And mm. I, I mean, I'm sure people used it before, but that's kind of when Christians started pointing to other Christians and mean like, you're being too worldly. And um, anyways, I thought it was interesting. Yeah, and this still permeates. I know we should wrap this up. But yeah. again, we're... It's just a fascinating topic to see where stuff comes from, I guess. Yeah, and... And if you couldn't guess by listening, we're like still trying to figure this stuff out. It is extremely oh, yeah. new it's to us. And it's, really, and it's really fun uh, for us. Like we talk our faces off about this now nonstop. And we're reading the Bible more than ever and really becoming more self-aware, I think, of different ways we've interpreted scripture and different lenses that we've had on in, in years past. And and I think that is helpful. I think it's helpful to be aware of the lens that you naturally have when you go to God's word. And that lens was probably developed through your childhood, through the church that you were brought up in, through the lack of church that you were brought up in, through the, and I, I go through all these people that were in a direct like line with Darby and we had like all their books in our home growing up, you know, I already mentioned DL Moody or, you know, Andrew Murray or, um, you know, I think of the Schofield Study Bible, you know, which was so influential, just study Bibles in general, and how that was a direct, like, downstream thing from Darby bringing this this uh, dispensational this dispensational concept to America, and then from there, you know, I think of all of the all of the Bible schools that started from that. That was a, another huge thing because all of a sudden we wanted to equip the layman, which is so great right? It's so great that we had this desire to equip the layman. And so all these Bible colleges were started for people that maybe weren't going to be professional ministers, but they were just going to be laymen and they needed to know God's word. Like, wow, that's, that's so good. But they were all, they all came from this line of thinking. And so there was dispensationalism and they were heavily new premillennialists in those positions. Um, but it's just fascinating because it's like every name that goes all the way up until, you know, modern day, because it goes to modern day, you just see this direct line, how they're downstream from, from this, from this thinking, from this lens to view from which, through which we view scripture. Yeah. So something that was like, you know, taking that like 23 and me, like ancestry test or whatever. And all of a sudden you're like, Oh my goodness, I have this in my ancestry. I haven't done it yet, but that's what I picture it being like. That was this moment where I read about, so I grew up with, um, like grandparents who didn't believe in being baptized or taking communion. Mm -hmm. And I've talked about that on this podcast. I got baptized as an adult. A lot of my family members have gotten baptized as adults after being saved for years and years and years. But we were just taught that baptism was something you didn't do. And a lot of us have taken communion in more recent years, but it was again, something I never knew, like, where did this come from? Mm -hmm. Like, Anytime we would talk to another Christian, they always look like me at me like I was an alien. Like, you haven't been baptized? Why? And it was so crazy. I'm like underlining it to hear, oh, ultra dispensationalists. Again, there's a term for this. Believed that there are these different dispensations of time. And they basically believed that the dispensation of grace, and, and I might butcher this, okay, I'm going to do it kind of vaguely. <laughs> I'm not very clear on the dispensations, but um, it started later. So basically, Paul in the early church, when he was mm, having people right. be baptized or even communion, that was still a part of the dispensational like law. So those things were under the law. And because we are free and under grace now, and this new dispensation is the church, that dispensation with ultra dispensationalists didn't start when Jesus rose from the dead. It started after the early church. And so therefore, by doing baptism, it would be the equivalent of like offering a sacrifice mm -hmm. or something like the Old Testament would be. So anyways, but I was just like, no way like this came from somewhere. It wasn't like just my grandpa who I respect so much. Like he was taught that from someone mm -hmm. who, and it was like handed down. And I, anyways, it was just one of those moments where I was like, it was really cool just for me to just know it like existed somewhere. I'm like there's other people who thought that way. Yeah. But yeah, and it's fun. Again, I, I, I really am grateful for this book. And I'm grateful. It's funny because uh, we, we, you can probably hear it. It's like we're becoming less dispensational, I think, as we 
learn more about it and we learn more about covenant theology. We're becoming mm-hmm. far more covenantal in the way we view God's word. But I think of all the people that were heavily dispensational and that were premillennialists and, and how I grew up, that, that, that emphasis on God's word, the verse by verse, you know, J. Vernon McGee or Chuck Missler or Chuck Smith and um, these guys that or, you know, Michael Pearl, for that matter, you know, again, a heavy, heavy dispensationalist and premillennialist. It's like all of their tea. And then I even think of like ATI, same thing coming from that fundamentalist. You see, you see mm-hmm. the fundamentalist movement and you go back to like the, because I think I was first called a fundamentalist like 10 years ago, you know, yeah. when I was trying to date someone that said I was a fundamentalist. And I was like, what is that? And so I looked it up and I was like, oh, like, okay, like guilty. I think, <laughs> I think I am all those things. And, and you, you, I'm grateful that that dispensational thread led to the establishing of the Christian fundamentals there. Then obviously from that, there came some legalism and people adopting it and applying it in different ways. But I'm, I'm so grateful for God's faithfulness and continuing to, I think it's been so imperfect. And I think we can learn from, uh, from the, the past. We can learn from people that have gone before us and hopefully improve upon it for the to, for the refining of the church, for the edifying of the body, to walk more effective as Christians, uh, I really do think that we can do that. And and like I said, I'm so grateful for that 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 I guess persistent pursuit of just people reading God's word. There, I, I think a lot of good has come from that. I do too. Yes, uh, all the people that I mentioned, you know, that the whole you know, Calvary Chapel movement, the verse by verse, the expository preaching um, that's become so popular. You're like, that's actually really, I think, overall good. It's um, a different form of accountability to have everybody in the church reading their own Bibles. No doubt. Um, you know, it's accountability for the leaders of the church. So just like we as members of the church need accountability from the leaders of the church, the leaders of the church have more accountability when they're flock is also studying the scripture yes and can communicate with them and um it's not this like far off right you know yeah yeah again i think the oh uh, well, yeah we go on i think the extreme is that that the, there is now no respect for the position of pastor or elder yeah it's and that's just, really sad it's just bro it's it's like we're peers we're all the same here and i don't think that's how the bible lays it out i think that there is a, a higher calling uh and, and definitely responsibility for pastor and and just like you know we honor the position of father or of husband not even so much because of the person but because of the position i think that there needs to be a there can be a a return to that when it's like hey a, a pat the past the position of pastor is an honorable position that has a tremendous responsibility there's a huge weight that comes with that mm-hmm. and so it shouldn't be entered into flippantly and it and it shouldn't be too quickly criticized and critiqued, I think, by the congregation as well. Um, Yeah, there needs to be a lot of respect for those roles instead of disdain and armchair quarterbacking for those roles. Right. Because it is a heavy role to to carry and a big duty and big responsibility. And I think, you know, some just one more thing I wanted to touch on because it stuck out to me so much was the Scofield Study Bible. And for whatever reason, I had a study Bible growing up and I just always thought like when I would do my little studies and go from one, you know, if I'm in Corinthians and it's rep- referencing, oh, well, this correlates to prophecy in Isaiah or something like that, then I would go to that reference. And for whatever reason, I assumed it was completely objective hmm. that everyone would have the same references explaining like the word of God explaining the word of God. Right. But dispensationalists really popularized this kind of like concordance in your Bible where, yes, it's the word of God explaining the word of God, but from a certain man's perspective who chose to say that this verse explains yeah. this verse, yeah. you know? And I don't know why that was so eye-opening to me, but it was. And I started thinking, I need to know who wrote the notes in my study Bible yeah, because, or in my children's study Bibles, because I'm reading it like this is just completely objective and that's how it's written is kind of like scientific but at the same time this is totally infused with man's opinion when i pick up a theology book off the shelf i know who wrote the book i know their theological background and mm. i know their slant and but i didn't have any clue with my study bible what their slant was mm. and i looking back it's like oh i had a very dispensational study bible mm-hmm. there was no credence given to covenant theology at all and so that 
was consistently enforcing my study of God's word, but I didn't realize that that was enforcing my study of God's word. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just something to be aware of, especially when we buy study Bibles for our children or give study Bibles or whatever, to really think, okay, real quick, who's writing these notes and what's the background to them? Um, Scoff, the guy who wrote the Scofield, what's his last name? I think it's it's Scofield, Scofield? I always heard it Scofield. Well, that totally makes sense. I pronounce everything wrong because I read the majority of the... Which words is cool. I say, so it's kind of unfortunate. But Schofield, um, he was a big gap theory guy. And so it's like, mm. that totally makes sense. And in my Bible, I was really surprised at, you know, I believed in a literal creation. I was taught literal, crea- literal creation, um, a short earth, a young earth. Yep. And I still have that belief system. But I was really surprised that it was reinforced, this gap theory, in yeah, he, my exactly. study he was, Bible. To many people, he was the first person to even introduce that, you know, this the seven day or the six day creation. It's like, well, these probably weren't literal days. You know, these are time. He, he like these are ages, you know, and he put that in his study Bible. Um, and that was a huge point. That was a that was a huge. Yeah, I guess a watershed moment in the church because um, that Bible is the Bible that was going out to yeah. all these missions because yeah. it was such a great resource to be able to cross reference the Bible. So anyways, it was kind of like a warning or an eye opening moment for me to just be like, whoa, again, this is something I've just been receiving hmm. and not considering what am I receiving here? And I think when we hear, when I grew up and I would hear certain terms or certain sects of Christianity, Christianity, I would immediately kind of have my guard up, like, okay, I'm going to take this with a grain of salt. But with dispensationalism and the theology that went along with that, I just absorbed it because, again, I just saw it as Christianity because it was so cultural. And that's something that really blew up dispensationalism was you had the scholarly dispensationalism. This is the last thing. But you also have pop dispensationalism. So you talk to a secular person and they know about the rapture. They know about the Left Behind series. They know about all the movies and talk shows and stuff that got publicized from this apocalyptic, dramatic um, projection, this imaginary... You know, people took it and ran with it with their imaginations. And um, so anyways, so much of culture has just been seeped in this, either from a pop angle or from a scholarly angle that, again, I just I just thought it was Christianity. And everything else was just like people being all dramatic about. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) About studying the Bible. And it's like, I'm over here with like no preconceived notions, just (laughs) reading the plain word of God. Right. (laughs) That has been infused by 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 history still. Right. So, anyways, it's been it's been a really cool read. I do think beautiful things have come through dispensationalism. It's been incredible, and I also think people have taken it and gone the wrong way with it too. And some of the weakness we have as Christians here in America kind of stems from a lack of grounding because we kind of find it repulsive. Um, in terms of in terms of systems, you sure. know, in terms of denominations or in terms of, I think a lot of the issues maybe we have with even like mega churches or there's just a lack of accountability to you know denominations. I always saw as being very unhelpful and divisive in the church, but then you're like, well, they do have some kind of doctrinal accountability. Yeah, you know, um, where a non-denominational church doesn't, and you can end up with a celebrity pastor who's just a really cool guy up there that doesn't really have to answer to yeah anyone anything, or anything. Yeah. you know. And so I think that can be kind of harmful too. So that's all a mixed bag. We're all we're all humans. Yeah, figuring out, and God is so gracious with us. Yeah, Amen. Folks, thank you all so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.